Um, now, without, without a break, um, seamlessly, I'm going to introduce uh, our main speaker today, Caroline Thompson. Caroline Thompson um, uh, had a fantastic career in the BBC, uh, where she rose to be Chief Operating Officer, and amongst other things, led the move from London to Salford. Do stay, this bit is going to be good. Those of you standing, make your way into the seats. Um, uh, Caroline uh, left the BBC, I think, a couple of years ago, um, and is now, now running the English National Ballet, but she's also got a really interesting non-executive um, portfolio as well, and she's non-executive in uh, UK digital. So she's got a lot to talk about. She's going to talk about managing change in large organisations, and we're extremely pleased, Caroline, to have you with us today. Couldn't make it up. Special attempt to trip up speakers, and just just in case there's too much heckling, I was right. uh, do heckle. <laughs> um, it's very nice to be here today, and I'm looking forward to trying the randomised coffee trial myself afterwards. Uh, sounds very intriguing. Uh, thank you very much for asking me. Uh, I think uh, uh, in the B I'm going to talk about the BBC uh, rather than about my more recent experience, and I think the BBC and uh, the civil service have many uh, challenges in common, uh, particularly uh, for those of us tasked with. Uh, running them and with being in the, uh, in the BBC terms uh, in the administration. And I'm going to put uh, uh, to you what is, uh, if you read the papers uh, assiduously, probably rather a controversial proposition, um, which is that the BBC is much, much better at change uh, than it believes it is and indeed uh, than you probably believe it is. Um, uh, uh, indeed, I think there's an argument that it's uh, one of the public uh, sector bodies uh, which is best at change. I wouldn't say it was the best, but it is, it is amongst the best, um, even though it doesn't believe itself it is. Uh, and what I would cite uh, as an example of that uh, is the, uh, the, the move into online and digital. Um, uh, and uh, John Burt, actually, uh, who was Director General at the time we did it, deserves much of the credit for this. But in the early 1990s, I actually was working at Channel 4, not at the BBC. Uh, and you'd have thought that Channel 4, with its remit to innovate in the form and content of programmes, uh, would have been the best uh, and first uh, to be in there on the internet. Uh, if you hadn't have thought of Channel 4, you'd probably have thought of Sky, uh, because Sky is a fantastic innovator in technology. The interesting thing is that the BBC beat both of them. Um, it did it partly, of course, because it uh, has, public f has public funding and therefore could take risks uh, when the dot-com bubble burst and so on, it could carry on investing. Uh, but it did it principally because it saw the opportunity uh, and had a strategy of doing it as a public service, uh, which wasn't an easy decision uh, to take at the time. Um, why is that? That's just one example of uh, how the BBC uh, has been uh, good at change and has, in order to do online, has had to adopt a whole lot of different cultures, uh, including the current director of Future Media, who runs the digital strategy, you know, is an is a, a American from the Bronx of Puerto Rican descent, uh, never been worked in broadcasting in his life. And the organization has had to adapt its culture uh, to embrace people like that. Uh, and I think there are two reasons why the BBC's been good at it. Uh, uh, one is that it's always operated in a competitive environment. Uh, so it's not been the sole provider uh, of its services. So it's had to compete for audiences at every stage of its life. Uh, well, every stage of life from the formation of ITV in the 1950s, not before then. And actually, there's quite a lot of examples uh, from other broadcasters in other European countries where they didn't have the introduction of commercial television as early as we did, uh, where the national broadcasters have atrophied and had real problems coping with competition later on. So I think the competitive landscape for audiences, but not competing for money, going back to my point about online, has been very important to that. And then the other thing which I think the BBC has been absolutely blessed with is its independence. Um, and that's often usually taken to mean its independence uh, because of impartiality in the news coverage and the programme content, which is clearly absolutely essential and totally, uh, a totally important, uh, vital underpinning 
uh, of, of how the BBC operates. But when I negotiated the last BBC charter, one of the things I was most anxious to get in, which had been in previous charters, was that the BBC was independent in the management of its affairs. And I think that independence in management, which actually I think is coming a bit under attack nowadays, uh, has been absolutely uh, essential uh, for changing the culture, for being able to adapt and employ different people with different skills on different terms and so on. Um, uh, not being part of uh, the main public sector machine uh, has been very important. Um, but that's a sort of general introduction. Uh, what I was going to talk about actually is Salford, which uh, Richard mentioned uh, to begin with, because that was the, uh, perhaps the main change project uh, which I was responsible for in my last five years at the BBC. Um, uh, and if you believe the press reports on Salford, you'd think it was very expensive, it was a waste of money, it was all political correctness gone wrong. Um, uh, the most recent one you know, reflected on an NAO report, which, by the way, the NAO report uh, ref concluded uh, that the project had been finished on time and within its budget, but you wouldn't have believed that if you read the press reports, which talked endlessly about inadequate controls and uh, inadequate paperwork documenting exceptional payments. Um, uh, but in fact, uh, the reality of Salford has been, uh, I would argue, a considerable success. Not perfect, but a considerable success. The reality is there's now up and running there uh, a BBC operation with 2,300 jobs. Uh, 1,500 of them moved from London, uh, and 800 were there already in another building uh, in Manchester, in Oxford Road. Uh, so they had to move into the new buildings. Of the 1,500, I know many of you in the audience will be engaged in uh, large-scale moves of the, from the civil service, so you might be interested in some of this. Of the 1,500 uh, jobs uh, that moved, um, just over 40% of them uh, were filled from people in, in, by people from London. So we moved, uh, just getting on for 50% of the London staff to Salford, but we then had to recruit the other 50% either locally or from elsewhere in the BBC. And actually that was quite a good mix. You didn't want everyone to move, um, uh, and you, only, you wanted the great enthusiasts to move, um, uh, but you also needed to, wanted to be able to recruit new skills, and you did need. Uh, early on in my management of Salford, I talked to a friend of mine in the civil service who'd been engaged in moving some part of the DWP, I think it was, to Bootle. Uh, and I think she, she'd got, they'd got 12% of people to move from London to Bootle. And at that point, I nearly had hysterics. I thought, God, you know, we'll never keep children's programs on air if we only get 12% to move. And of course, it's very different because the DWP jobs were mostly clerical and people could find other jobs in London. Whereas if you want to make sports programs, the BBC is the place to be, or children's programs. Uh, but still, that was about the right mix, probably. We now have three sets of offices there. The, there's a big piazza, I don't know if any of you have been to it. Uh, there's a studio block with a state-of-the-art large studios, high-definition studios, which we don't own, we lease space from. Sorry, we, the BBC, I still talk about we. It uh, doesn't own it, uh, leases space. There's a home for the BBC Orchestra, which allows audiences in, so local communities can come and participate in orchestral events. Uh, Salford University is on the site, ITV has now moved in, and absolutely crucially, the set for Corrie has moved to just across uh, the water uh, next to the Imperial War Museum. So it's becoming a real media. Our move has, be has made it a real media hub. Um, uh, how did we do, oh, and, and obviously it's broadcasting BBC Breakfast and BBC Sport and children's programmes, Five Live, comes from there uh, 24 hours a day, five, seven days a week. Um, how did we get there? Well, this might be of interest to those of you who are managing big change projects. It was a bad beginning. Um, uh, I took on, I actually volunteered to take on responsibility for Salford, partly because uh, I just bought a house in Cumbria and was wanting to move, spend a bit more time in the northwest. Um, it was a basket case of a project at that stage. Uh, Greg Dyke had conceived of it uh, as an idea and realizing that the BBC would not want to do it. Uh, had bypassed the executive committee completely and gone straight to the old then Board of Governors to get approval for it. So there was no ownership of it, even at the executive board level, let alone further down in the organisation. It felt like something that had been forced on the organisation by a director general who, of course, by this stage had left. Um, I did my first meeting of the steering group, which was with very senior people, uh, and it was the most difficult, still remains the most difficult meeting I've ever done in the BBC uh, for the sense of hostility I was getting from people who were after all my peer group, my colleagues. Uh, and for the only time in my time at the BBC, uh, perhaps luckily the only time, but anyway, um, uh, 
from that meeting, uh, someone went out and briefed the trade unions who then briefed the Guardian about some of the issues about the resettlement uh, schemes. Um, that was, you know, it was a shocking piece of uh, betrayal, I felt, at the time. Uh, and I, uh, it was so shocking that I absolutely I had to put my foot down. I s sent an email around immediately, and I said, this is not tolerable. And they all, everyone protested I was being deeply unfair. Uh, but uh, let's put it this way, it didn't happen again. Um, uh, but I did realize at that point we had to start again, and this wasn't going to work. Uh, so what I did was I reconstituted uh, the group of people who were going to work on the project with me. Um, and I said to the senior people, I don't think you've got the time to be involved in this. Uh, well, why don't we find people who can really put their backs into making it work? And uh, uh, that way I was able to more hand pick people. Uh, they weren't by any means uh, all uh, evangelists for the project, uh, but they were people who I felt were persuadable. They had a difficult task because they were working in bits of the BBC which were very hostile to this. So they had to be quite brave as well. Uh, I took them all there. Uh, as the first thing, before we had a meeting, we went and we had uh, uh, a steak and chips in the Café Rouge in, uh, outside the Lowry Centre. Miraculously, the sun shone, which was to be <laughs> a real achievement uh, for Salford. Uh, and uh, Manchester United were playing that night, so the place was a buzz with people because the Old Trafford ground is just across the, uh, the road there, just across the canal there. Um, uh, uh, and uh, we had this, we sort of bonded, first of all. Uh, and one of the things I tried to encourage, I think, was a bit of a sense of a sort of Dunkirk spirit about this, um, which is what I'd had in the early days when I was at Channel 4, and I think is a very effective way of building a team, um, uh, and enthused them with the vision. Uh, and what I said to them right from the beginning is, this is not a project about buildings. Our task is not to build buildings or cause buildings to be built on time and on budget. Our task is to recreate the BBC. Uh, you very rarely get the opportunity to have a greenfield site and you know, establish new ways of working and new sets of people working there. And this is your chance to create the BBC you've always dreamed of. Uh, and that was the vision which worked and the mantra which uh, I carried on repeating, and I'll come back to this even after the project was finished, uh, because I think you have to keep on saying it to people. Uh, but uh, certainly the BBC is lucky in being full of people who care desperately about the BBC, much in the way the civil service will be. Uh, and um, giving them that as the task uh, was the thing which I think inspired them. Having done that, you then had to run the project in line with that vision. Uh, and so what sort of things does that mean? Well, uh, the example I would give was the steering group. So uh, as I say, this wasn't, I was positioning this as not a project about buildings. Uh, so it wasn't a question of a buildings and property, a property and technology team delivering to the program makers. Uh, it was a question of the whole team uh, working together. So we had a steering group uh, which, was, which jointly owned the project, which had on equal terms the property people who were managing the build, the technology people, the people from children's programs, the people from sports programs, the people from Five Live, people from Manchester, and so on, all there on equal terms, uh, owning the vision owning the project, owning the design of the inter interior of the buildings, and so on. Uh, and one of the things I was most pleased with, uh, even with hindsight, that we did with that project was with that team. Uh, an example of how we got them to jointly own it was uh, uh, we had a contingency, obviously, for the project. And the, those of you who have been involved in buildings will know the absolutely crucial thing with building projects is to control the change requests. That's what mucks, them up, mucks up the costs dreadfully. And I thought, how am I going to know the tradition would have been, I, the change requests would have come to me and I would have sa sanctioned them. And uh, how am I going to know whether children's really needs a presentation studio of its own, for example? I, know, I didn't feel I was in a position to judge that, but I thought this group on the steering group are. So I said to the steering group, you own the contingency. Everyone who wants a change request has got to come and pitch the change request to the steering group and their colleagues will ask them questions. Uh, and we have a tradition of doing that with sort of program review at the BBC. So that, you know, there was, it was a sort of model that the program side recognised. Uh, and then the group as a whole will take a decision on which change requests to validate. And that was crucial to keeping us within the contingency. Indeed, I think we underspent the contingency as a result of it. And an example of it, which is rather a terrifying BBC story, really, was that one day we had a, a group from Radio 4 who make programmes like File on 4 in Manchester. I never always done that. 
uh, coming and saying, we need a special studio to create, to, to, to record our documentaries, and there isn't one in the plan at the moment. Uh, and then, shortly later in the meeting, Five Live came and said, we, we occasionally make special built programs, not everything is live, we need a special studio to record our built programs, our documentaries. Uh, so, with one accord, I didn't have to say it, with one accord, everyone around the table said, well, you know, you're not going to use your studio all the time, neither is Radio 4, we'll build one yeah. studio and you can share it. Uh, and the, uh, uh, one of the, I can't remember whether it's Five Live or Radio 4, said, you can't possibly do that. The acoustic requirements for Radio 4 are completely different from the acoustic requirements for Five Live. But we did it. <laughs> and uh, I think that was a very interesting example of how you could, by this joint ownership, uh, you could get changes and uh, keep things under control. Uh, the other thing I learned from this group, however, was that it was very important to listen. Uh, that in the initial sort of blueprint, you don't always get everything right. You need to know the bits of the blueprint that are non-negotiable. But you can, you can shift on others. Uh, and another example of that, which was actually one of the things the NAO report uh, focused on the cost of, but it was essential to getting it right, uh, was that we realised we'd got the change package wrong. We'd assumed people would take firm decisions to move move the whole family and their housing and everything. So we had a set of, of uh, uh, arrangements for, for helping them with the costs of that, where we wanted them to move. Um, we, we revisited that, and we offered people an option of sucking, of essentially trying it, piloting it for their lives. So they could have up to two years, uh, and they would have assistance with rental, uh, but they wouldn't have to move, commit to moving their whole lives and their whole family there. And that was absolutely crucial for people who were a bit iffy about, was it really for them, were they going to want to live in Salford, who obviously had children who were doing GCSEs and they couldn't move their family anyway. Uh, and I think it was key to getting the number of people moved up to nearer the 50% mark, which for, given that we were doing continuous output, was absolutely crucial for us. We, we couldldn't have started if we'd, if we'd only got 10 or 15 percent moving, we couldn't have retrained everyone. Um, it wasn't all plain sailing, of course. Um, uh, we did get some things, we got a number of things wrong, and the things I would just reflect on to you now were um, one of the problems with big projects like this is the, te the technology moves so fast in a technologically based industry like the BBC, like broadcasting. The trouble is, you know, you plan the technology five, eight years ago, and by the time it's there, it's obsolete pretty well. Uh, and we've had, we had that problem with the technology fit out. Uh, and also, uh, to some extent, with studios and the commitments to the uh, contract with the studio provider. Um, uh, perhaps also interestingly, the other thing I think we lost sight of was we put so much effort into the people who were moving from London, uh, we were inclined to forget those who were in Manchester, and they began to feel already, and we, they began to feel a bit like second-class citizens in this project. You know, they were there already, and you know, no one was making a fuss at them, and uh, so on. And uh, uh, with hindsight, in some ways, that was that was the biggest uh, mistake we made because I think there's been some legacies in the way the operations still run. Uh, and then, of course, there are the inevitable things. Uh, car parking. <laughs> uh, every, every project I've ever been involved in with anything to do with people in buildings uh, has involved rows about car parking. Um, but all in all, it's pretty successful. And the lessons I would just draw, uh, as I draw to inclusion now, uh, for you today and for, uh, I would put out to you as, as points I took away from it, uh, was that uh, if you're going to do a really big change project like this, you, first of all, you really need to know what you want to achieve. You need to define the outcome and what a successful outcome looks like. And you need to set that vision high um, and, uh, and, and be absolutely clear about it in your own mind because uh, it does take leadership and uh, that leadership will come under a lot of pressure at various stages and you need to know uh, where it's going and indeed you need to have the right backing for it uh, from your seniors. Uh, having done that, you, th you can then set out on the right footing. You need to make sure you've got the right people. They won't all be enthusiasts, but they need to be people uh, who can be persuaded. Uh, and if you have any complete no hope gainsayers, uh, naysayers, uh, then uh, you need to find a way of uh, getting them out because they can poison the whole atmosphere. Uh, it takes a lot of energy. 
uh, from the leader. You need to be prepared all the time to remind people of the vision, to put your personal energy into it. Just sort of, I think of it as a sort of, you know, transference of this, uh, I'm going to sort of bore you and get, you know, get you, not bore you, enthuse you, but more into you with, with my energy and, you know, get, get you to own it as well. Uh, so you can become a part of the project and part of selling it to the rest of the organization. Um, uh, so you do that and you inspire them with this vision. Um, uh, you need to run, the, having done that, you need to live the vision and the values associated with it and run the project in line with that and trust people. Uh, I've almost never been disappointed in my 25 years of management uh, by the experience of trusting people. Um, I think the, the, my experience is people almost always respond to it uh, infinitely better than you expect and you get much the best results out of it from that way. Um, reinforce or have the support for the real evangelists and get them so it's not just, it doesn't become you just as a one-man band. As the project works, it becomes, you know, three people and then those three people become nine people and so on. Uh, and that's a, a great way of helping to make it work. Um, empower the group uh, and make sure they own it. Listen and change if necessary. Be prepared to change. Uh, celebrate success. Very, very important. And try and just learn the lessons from failure. Uh, rather than going in for witch hunts, which are so fashionable nowadays. Um, uh, and then my final thought is, don't ever think it's finished. Even once the project's essentially completed as a project, uh, you've got to keep that vision alive. You've got to go and say to people, this is about you know, a new BBC. Uh, and if you can do that, and I was very fortunate in handing over, I managed the project by handing over the management uh, to some Peter Salmon, uh, who absolutely had the same vision as I had, uh, and who's kept it alive, and you know, walks the talk uh, week after week uh, there in Salford, with the result that it has achieved uh, you know, a lot of what we set out to do. Thank you very much. We were going to do a Q&A session, and I'm looking at the back. Do we have time, or do we have to go on? I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. I'm really sorry, because we had a late start. Caroline, if you're around for a bit afterwards, maybe I'm around, so. um, Caroline's around, so maybe you kind of find Caroline, um, and maybe we can have a chat afterwards. But that's the end of this session. Caroline, I'm hugely grateful to you. Lots of parallels between what you did successfully and what we're trying to do. I'm really interested in the thing about initiation and how that didn't work. But anyway, I won't go on. Caroline, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you.